Samuel. So today we'll be talking about a really important topic in um, the, the spectrum of the congenital heart disease, which is uh, transposition of retro arteries. So um, this is a, a quick overview for, for what we'll be talking about today. Um, this is a, a really important topic and quite a big one. So we'll be um, uh, talking about TGA uh, in a few talks. So we'll start with this one. This will be a very general background about what is TGA, um, uh, what are the common associations, um, uh, a talk about uh, anatomy um, and relevant uh, features. Um, we'll touch about the pathophysiology and natural history. And then um, uh, so we'll continue about diagnosis. Uh, next time, inshallah. And then we'll be talking about, uh, really intense, about uh, management of TGA. So um, let's start. So when we say TGA, um, meaning transposition of great arteries, what, what do we actually mean by that? So uh, di different people mean different things, and there is, there is some confusion there. So. Um, uh, We'll be defining TGA, essentially DTGA, D dextro TGA, as AV concordance, VA discordance. So, what, what do we mean by that? So, a normally connected heart, systemic veins are connected to the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, deoxygenated blood will go to the lungs, get oxygen, and then come back oxygenated through pulmonary veins, left atrium, left ventricle, aorta. Mm. And then so the oxygenated blood coming back from the lungs will be delivered to the systemic circulation. And then they will continue these two cycles, systemic veins to the lungs, pulmonary veins to the aorta and vice versa. Keep, we keep going like that. Patients with DTGA have AV concordance, by which we mean that right atrium is connected to the morphologic right ventricle left atrium is connected to the morphologic left ventricle. But then there's VA discordance. And so the right ventricle is connected to the aorta, pumping back deoxygenated blood into the systemic circulation. While the, the already oxygenated blood coming back from the lungs, left atrium, left ventricle, will go back through the pulmonary artery again back to the lungs. So we're going into two parallel circulations here. Okay. So when we say TGA, meaning DTGA, and I, I need to um, have good distinction here, we're talking about DTGA and not LTGA, which, which is a totally different entity. With, we're not going to discuss this now. Maybe we have a talk, a separate talk for that. But th uh, this is different. So we're talking about DTGA, and by which we mean AV concordance, VA discordance. So. When we say DTGA, we do not necessarily mean that the aorta is to the right. This is common. It is commonly anterior and to the right. But this is not necessary for the definition. Mm, when we say DTGA, okay, people say de-looping of the ventricles. Okay? But for practical reasons, we're just meaning AV concordance, VA discordance. This is the important feature for the pathophysiology for the presentation and the management of these, of these cases. You can actually rarely get aorta anterior to the left while still having AV concordance, VA discordance. This is rare, but if it is there, we'll just treat them as this disease, not a different one. So, because the pathophysiology, presentation, and the management is affected by the connections rather than relationship of grades. <coughs> And just mentioned that aorta is anterior to the right, but this is uh, not necessary. Uh, and again, to be specific here, we're talking about patients who have two good ventricles that are septatable. Okay? Because uh, again, this can be a feature in patients with single ventricle or so, so we're, we're not talking about this now, maybe, maybe later in the topic of single ventricle. <coughs> so this is not a rare disease, actually quite common. So this is the second most common cyanotic congenital heart disease. 
So of all cyanotic congenital heart disease, this is the, the second most common after the tetralogy of fallow. Actually, it is the most common cyanotic heart disease presenting in neonates, because usually the fallow do not present that early. So while the TGA, patients can present with real cyanosis very early on. Um, it occurs in about 0.2 per 1,000 live births. So we're talking about two cases of TGA in every 10,000 live births. Um, uh, it accounts for so something like 5% of congenital cardiac malformation, which is, which is not rare. And uh, there's um, uh, more likelihood to, be, to come in males, so male to female ratio of 2 to 1. Okay? So we'll, we'll go through quickly through uh, basic background of normal anatomy, uh, which is, again, very important to appreciate uh, what happens in the TGA and why, why is it is different from normal. So this is um, uh, a cost for the cavity of the, of the cardiac chambers. So this represents the SVC, IVC at the back, going to the right atrium. This is the site of the tricuspid valve, into right ventricle, RVOT, pulmonary verification. While at the back, we just see the tips here of the pulmonary veins going back to the left atrium at the back. We just can see the left atrial appendage here, which is connected to the left ventricle. This is the LV apex. And then the LVOT at the back going into the ascending port. Okay. So I can appreciate here that um, both outflow tracts are actually perpendicular to each other. So, and why is that? Um, the left ventricle is posterior and to the left of the right ventricle. Okay? And this left ventricle eventually needs to connect to the ascending aorta, which is actually anterior and to the right of the pulmonary verification. So the posterior to the left wants to connect to the anterior to the right. While on the other hand, the opposite occurs with the right ventricle. So the right ventricle, which is anterior to the right, needs to connect to the pulmonary verification, which is posterior to the left of the ascending aorta. And so the, the outflow tracts need to cross each other. Okay. Um, so this is a, a, a diagram showing the cavity of the right ventricle. So we're looking from anterior. We're, we're reflecting the free wall of the right ventricle, looking into RV cavity. So this is SVC, IVC, right atrium. This is the tricuspid from the RV side. This is RV cavity, and this is pulmonary artery. So you can see here that um, the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve are not in direct continuity. Not like the left ventricle where the mitral and the aortic valve have fibrous continuity. We, we just see that. And then we can see that the pulmonary root um, sits on a, on a cone of muscle. We call that conus, okay? Which is um, a muscle all around. We can actually, in the Ross operation, separate the whole pulmonary root from the heart without cutting any other structures, okay? Uh, while, while in the aortic root, it does have fibrous continuity with mitral and conduction tissue and things. And so, so you can see this is the direction of the RVOT, while the direction of the LVOT is at the back going there. Um, here is the diagram. Again, all that we're just discussing normal anatomy. We have not touched about uh, TGA yet. So uh, here we're, we're taking out atria and great arteries. I'm looking from above. So this is anterior, posterior, right, and to the left. And we're looking from above. So this is mitral, aortic valve, tricuspid, pulmonary valve. Uh, this is RV cavity, or this is LV cavity. And this is a, a, a diastolic uh, view, and this is the systolic view. <coughs> so um, we said here that outflow tracts cross each other. Okay. At the level of the valves, the aortic and pulmonary valves, 
the pulmonary valve is anterior to the aortic valve and it's on its left side. Okay? We can see that here. So this is the normal pulmonary valve, well aortic valve here. So this is the pulmonary valve is normally anterior and slightly to the left of the aortic valve. Um, and obviously you can appreciate that the, uh, the, the planes of the both valves are not uh, parallel to each other. They're actually crossing, so the aortic valve is like there and the pulmonary valve is like that. And then you can see um, coronary arteries coming from the aortic root. So um, the aortic root has three sinuses. So one sinus gives a coronary artery that goes towards the right. So this is the right coronary artery. And then, so we call that the right coronary sinus. While well, this is left coronary artery, which eventually uh, bifurcates into LADL circumflex. And again, so we call this the left coronary sinus. And then there's a third sinus that gives no coronary, and then we just call it non-coronary sinus. Okay. So we can notice here that both coronary arteries arise from sinuses that face the pulmonary artery. So you can just call them facing sinuses. Okay? And then the, the third one would be the non-facing sinus. Right? Okay. Uh, you can appreciate again the aortomitral continuity. So the, the aortic root is in direct continuity with both fibrous trigones, aortomitral curtain, and anteriometral leaflet, which is different from the pulmonary root that we know is surrounded all around by muscle, by cox. Okay. And so here, uh, here you can see that, that's a cut section, like a three chamber view or so, so like that. Uh, into the left atrium, left ventricle, LVOT aorta, and then you can see that this is a mitral leaflet, direct continuity between a mitral leaflet and uh, the aortic valve, with no muscle in between. Okay, so uh, uh, we've kept stressing that the both outflow tracts of both ventricles cross each other, so they are not on the same plane. And so if you, if you get a short axis on one outflow, you get actually the other one as a long axis. This is quite evident in echo. So, so somehow we'll be discussing echo in details. I just want to, to correlate this to the anatomy, because this is a parasthenia short axis view on echo, where you can see the aortic valve as a short axis, while the pulmonary valve is on the, on the long axis. So they, are, they cannot be both short axis or long axis together because they are actually nearly perpendicular to each other. So they cross each other. <coughs> so which ventricle normally, which ventricle is exposed to higher pressure? Is it the LV or the RV? LV. Why is that? It is connected to the systemic circulation. So, so the systemic vascular resistance is higher than pulmonary vascular resistance. And so to, to be able to pump the same amount of blood, the left ventricle will have to exert higher pressure to push against the high resistance, while the right ventricle will just push a small push in, and then the, the amount of blood will just pass without needing to increase the pressure. Okay? So normally the LV pressure is higher than RV pressure. And we have said before that uh, chambers exposed to higher pressure get thick wall, while chambers exposed to low pressure usually have thin walls. So if you get a short um, axis cut into both ventricles, so this is like getting a cut here and looking from below, which is again very similar to the uh, short axis view of echo at the level of the ventricles. And then you can see this is LV, here is RV. LV wall thickness is a lot more than RV wall thickness. Why is that? Again, this is consequence to higher pressure. This is not a feature of the LV itself. 
So if RV gets exposed to higher pressure, it will get thicker wall. It's just adaptation to the higher pressure. And since th this chamber has higher pressure, actually the septum will be pushed towards the other chamber. So normally, the curvature of the interventricular septum is towards the right ventricle. Okay? Again, this is all normal. So let's discuss TG. So what is TG? TG is AV concordance, VA discordance. So the right ventricle is connected to the aorta, while the left ventricle is connected to the pulmonary. So the right ventricle is anterior to the right, needs to be connected to the ascending aorta, which is anterior to the right, while LV is posterior to the left, connected to the pulmonary bifurcation, again posterior to the left. So they do not need to cross each other. So there is a characteristic feature in TGA that both great outflow tracts and great vessels actually are parallel. So here, this is an uh, open chest in, um, in a, um, uh, cardiac surgery. We're looking from, from the front. So this is the head, the feet, right and left. We're looking from uh, the front. This is RV connected directly to the aortic root into ascending aorta. You can actually see coronary arteries coming from this aortic root. While L LV at, at the back is connected to this artery, which will, you will just believe me that it then bifurcates to go to the lungs. So this is pulmonary artery. And then um, they go uh, uh, parallel to each other. This is the, the common configuration where you get um, the aorta anterior to the right of the P. Okay? <coughs> And so if you have um, an echo view for TGA, you can actually characteristically get both great outflow tracts and great vessels come in parallel. So this is a, a, a view showing both um, outflow tracts um, in the long axis view, while this you get both outflow tracts in the short axis view, okay? while the, the aorta is anterior and to the right of the P. <coughs> I will not go into details of embryology, okay? If I, I mean, keep us short. So, uh, um, during, during the, uh, the, uh, the development of the fetus, um, the area of the um, conotruncus and the area where the roots separate, they're first uh, the common tube, and then you get an um, aortic pulmonary septum which septates these uh, uh, structures. And then this is actually the cause for the, this crossing, because that developing septum is actually spike, which directs the RV into the, the, the artery that will become pulmonary artery, and LV into that that becomes ascending aorta. Because of that spiral aortic pulmonary system. Okay. And so you get these cross crossing outflow tracks. Uh, and, and an oversimplification of what happens in the TGA that you do not get that septum as pipe. It just gets straight. And then you get the right ventricle connected to ascending aorta, while left ventricle connected into um, a pulmonary artery. Again, oversimplification, but, but just uh, aids uh, uh, understanding. So, TGA has really uh, some really common associations. Uh, <coughs> so nearly half of TGA are called simple TGA, as if this is a simple disease. So by, by simple TGA, we mean um, that the patient has TGA and nothing else apart from those structures that are normally present in any normal newborn. Okay, and by which we mean PDA, patent ductus, ductus arteriosus, which is an, um, an essential structure for the fetal circulation, which normally closes um, after birth, and PFO, so patent foramen ovale, which again uh, is a communication between two atria and then closes early after birth because of the different pressures. So patients with simple TGA usually have those, but then those two structures normally tend to close. While in the TGA, these structures are essential for survival. Okay. 
and that's only in, in about half of the patients. Um, another half of TGE have such common associations. So, so they are very common to the extent that we need to um, describe them because they do affect the pathophysiology presentation and the management of these patients. So uh, about one third of patients have um, a VSZ, so communication between two ventricles. Uh, about 10%. In addition to the VSD, we'll also have LVO tube structure. And if we say LVO tube structure in the context of TGE, we mean obstruction to the flow going to the, to the lungs, okay? Because it's a TGE. So um, those who say TGE, VSD, LVO tube structure, they mean TGE, VSD, PS, okay? Uh, about half percent will have um, LVH structure without having VSD, and some of those are dynamic, which we'll discuss, uh, discuss next time. <clears throat> so these are a really common association and do affect uh, how the, the TGE behaves and how we manage th those patients. Mm. Um, it is not a rare association to, in addition having uh, TGE, to also have an um, orthocoarctation or hypoplastic arch. So these associations are really common, so that we need to look specifically for them in every single patient. So uh, this is a specimen showing uh, a patient with TG. So uh, again, we're looking from the front, uh, taking out the free wall of the right ventricle, looking into RV cavity, tricuspid valve, and then we're supposed to see pulmonary valve going like that. We don't have, we're actually having ascending aorta. You can actually see a coronary artery coming from this. And still, this aortic valve is not in direct continuity with any valve here. So it sits on a conus. Okay? And the, the interventricular septum is, is intact. So if we flip that specimen and look from the other side, looking from the LV side, so again, the ventricle is, is bisected and looking into the cavity. So this is the, the mitral valve reflet, anti mitral valve reflet. And this is the LV. So you can see it gives an artery that bifurcates into the lungs. And there are no coronary arteries here. Um, interestingly, you can see there's, again, fibrous continuity between the mitral valve and that pulmonary valve. Okay? So this is um, uh, another patient with um, TGA with intact interceptor. Um, so that's uh, another patient who has uh, TGA, again, um, RV giving uh, ascending ortho. But then you can see a big VSD here, okay? So this is um, a big communication between the LV and RV. And then there's the toxic being around. What is the toxic being around? That's a double outlet right ventricle with subpulmonary VSD. What does that have to do with, with what we're discussing? So what, what's a double, double outlet ventricle? We'll, we'll discuss that later. So essentially, we're just giving a hint about this anomaly because it's very, very related to TG. So double outlet ventricle is the disease you, where you have more than 50% of both red vessels coming from the red ventricle. So essentially, one red vessel totally coming from the red ventricle, and more than half of the other also comes from the right ventricle, okay? In this specific case, there's the, the aorta totally comes from the right ventricle, and then more of half of the pulmonary artery, so this is the ventricular septum, if you continue that, you'll find more of than half of the pulmonary artery comes from the right ventricle, okay? So this is a double outlet right ventricle. And so the LV has to have an output, and that outflow is through the VSD. And this VSD just sits below the pulmonary artery. So the double outlet right ventricle with subpulmonary VSD is the toxic binganum. So what does have this have to do with, with TGE? It's actually quite similar. So let's, let's think about a patient who has a TGE VSD. Okay? So the systemic venous return, the deoxygenated blood, come back through systemic veins into right atrium, right ventricle, and then goes into the aorta. While pulmonary veins into left atrium, left ventricle, pulmonary. 
And then there's a big VSD where a lot of the systemic blood will be shunted across that VSD into the pulmonary circulation. And there's direct transmission of pressure into the pulmonary circulation. So the pulmonary pressure is high, pulmonary flow is high. So deoxygenated blood going to the water, oxygenated blood going to the pulmonary, high pulmonary pressure, high pulmonary flow. So let's think about this patient. SVC, IVC, right atrium, right ventricle. And then the whole aorta comes from the right ventricle. So deoxygenated blood going to the aorta. While pulmonary veins, left atrium, left ventricle. And then blood coming very quickly through that VSD. And then it just finds the pulmonary artery in front of it. So by streaming, most of the oxygenated blood coming out from the left ventricle will go into the pulmonary artery. And then there's a big communication between both ventricles. So the systemic pressure is transmitted into the lungs. So high pulmonary pressure, high pulmonary flow. Again, very similar physiology. Actually, if this pulmonary artery was just coming there, it would have been PGA PSD. Okay. So why bother? Just call it TGA PSD. Actually, it is, it is different. It does have some differences, and these differences are actually clinically relevant. So patients with TGA BSD um, uh, quite commonly get um, great vessels side by side rather than anthroposterior, okay? which does have implications on surgery. Um, they do get more commonly uh, abnormal coronary artery patterns. So um, again, Many of these patients will have to do RTS switch operation where we transfer coronary arteries. So abnormal coronary patterns makes um, coronary transfer much harder. Uh, so many times this structure, the structure is the conal septum, infundibular septum, which is actually shifted towards the right ventricle. That's why the pulmonary artery is going that way. And then sometimes this coronal septum actually gets near to the free wall of the right ventricle. And so the blood going into the ascending aorta will actually be less than normal and blood will actually preferentially go into the pulmonary artery. So the amount of blood going into the aorta will be less than normal. And so the development of the ascending aorta and essentially the aortic arch will be less. So they commonly get hypoplastic aortic arch and coarctation. Okay? So again, ag again, common association with, with the top sibling. So although it is very similar to TGAVSD, yet there are some um, uh, differences and actually clinically relevant um, uh, associations. So they are more commonly to have side-by-side -side vessels, more commonly to get abnormal coronary patterns. They can get um, a hypoplastic aortic arch. Um, the closure, so the arterial switch is more difficult because of the of the side by side and the abnormal coronaries and the need for to do also arch repair during the arterial switch, but also the VSD closure is actually uh, more difficult because of the, the high overrides. <coughs> so this is uh, this is again a patient with tacit being anomaly. Uh, so the aorta comes completely from the right ventricle, more than half of the pulmonary artery, coronal septum. Uh, uh, near the, the free wall. And then you can see the ascending aorta. This is a CT uh, with the reconstruction. And you can see the um, hypoplastic aortic arch. Well, actually, most of the descending aorta is supplied by pectin duct arteriosus. OK? <coughs> so so we're, we've seen patients with TG intact septum, seen patients with TG VSD, the very related disease to the TGA VSD, the tough signaling anomaly. And now we, we, we discuss um, the incidence of LVOT obstruction with, with TGA. So again, um, LVOT obstruction in the context of TGA means pulmonary stenosis, OK? Pulmonary stenosis can be um, uh, anything valvular or subvalvular. So the, the whole pulmonary valve, the pulmonary root as a whole can be small. Um, it can be of, of good size, adequate size, while the 
cusps are fused, so still the orifice is narrow. They can get a posterior deviation of the coronal septum causing pelvic obstruction. They can get um, uh, accessory tissue um, in, um, sitting into the LVOT um, causing that obstruction. Can get abnormal uh, mitral cords getting attached to the interventricular septum. So all sorts of things. Can get um, uh, dynamic obstruction, which we'll, dis we'll discuss um, uh, next time, shortly. So this is uh, a picture showing, so this is LV going to the pulmonary artery and um, accessory tissue, abnormal tissue tag uh, from the valve uh, sitting into the LVOT causing LVOT obstruction. Um, we'll give a, a quick hint about uh, coronary arteries because this is very relevant, um, especially talking about the arterial switch operation where we need to switch coronary arteries. Do you remember talking about normal coronary arteries in, no in normal cases? So we said coronary arteries come out from facing sinus. We call them right coronary sinus and left coronary sinus because this is the very usual across the vast majority of people. But then in the TGA, it is difficult to call them right and left because the relationship of great vessels can be anything. So they can be anterior posterior, can be side by side, uh, very rarely can get aorta to the left, even posterior sometimes um, um, to the, so, and then, so this, this artery was on the left side of the patient and this artery, so if, if you assume that this is the pulmonary artery and this is the aorta, this is one patient where the aorta is anterior to the right, as if we're looking from above. So here, uh, this is one coronary coming on the right side of the patient and then on the left side. On the other hand, if the relationship of great vessels is reversed, the same coronary will be on the right while the other will be on the left. So again, calling right and left here will just cause confusion. So um, many have um, advised uh, just naming them as regards to the relationship of great vessels. So not in relationship to the patient. So let's assume that uh, we've transected both roots. I am sitting inside the aortic root, looking towards the pulmonary root. And then the coronary artery or the sinus comes from m on the my, my right hand side. We'll call this sinus one. And the other one on my left hand side while I'm sitting in the aorta looking towards the pulmonary the sinus that sits on my left-hand side, we put that sinus two. And then you, d you describe, okay, the LADS circumflex comes from sinus one, the right comes from sinus two, or, or whatever, okay? And uh, this facilitates communication between different, different people. <coughs> so, um, in this example, this is the aorta. The common, the common configuration where aorta is anterior to the right of the pulmonary artery. So the, the, if I sit in the aorta, looking towards the pulmonary, the sinus on my right hand side would be sinus one, <coughs> the other one on my left hand side would be sinus two. And this specific patient, sinus one gives LED and circumflex, while sinus two gives right coronary artery. Uh, uh, please notice that on imaging, I mean echo, and CT, we usually have the view as if we're looking from below. And then this will be the reverse. So sinus one will be on left hand side and sinus two will be on the right hand because you're just taking from, from below. Now here, we're just describing as if looking from above like we see during search. So just, just uh, uh, know the difference. And uh, I keep saying uh, LAD and circumflex come from here, right comes from there because um, actually, any of the three great vessels can, can come in different configurations. So circumflex can come from the right coronary artery. So we don't know, do not say the left main comes from here and right main comes from there. We just describe uh, the origin of the three. Uh, again, the configuration of the coronary arteries is, is of big importance. Um, one, one of the first description for the classification of the coronary arteries in TGA um, uh, was published by Professor Jakub in the 70s, describing um, 
the different configurations that can be present and uh, actually the way for switching them uh, during search. Um, and so uh, this is the most common configuration where LED and circumflex come from sinus 1 while right come from sinus 2. This is corresponding to uh, Yakub type A, um, uh, coronary artery element. Um, uh, uh, this, the second most common is that when you get um, circumflex artery coming with the right from sinus 2, and then the circumflex will just go all around the pulmonary root into the left AV group, while LED comes separately from sinus 1. So these are the, the two most common um, uh, configurations, type A, and this is type D. So you know, during the RTS switch, we transect the the roots, we transfer the coronaries to the other root, and we switch the great arteries. And so during the RTS switch, we cut out the sinus around the coronary arteries so that they can be switched to the other root. And then we can have um, some bad surprise, where you look from, uh, from outside, you can see uh, one coronary coming from here, another coronary coming from the wall of the aorta there. So you start transecting the, so you transect the roots, and then you start cutting out the sinus, and then you actually do not find the ostium of this coronary coming from the sinus. It actually passes inside the wall of the aorta, going inside the wall, and then opening into an ostium at the other sinus. So if you actually cut out that sinus, you cut across the coronary artery. Not a nice thing to do. So we call this intramural coronary. And this, this is not rare with RTA switch, with the TGA, sorry. So you, you can get intramural coronary. So intramural coronaries is a coronary passing inside the wall of the aorta, not inside the muscle of the ventricle, okay? Inside the wall of the aorta. And it does have a big implication during surgery because we can cut across the coronary and then you get a, a real, a real trouble. <clears throat> so this is a specimen showing TGA, again, very similar to the diagram that we've shown. Uh, looking from above, this is aorta, anterior, pulmonary, posterior, this is mitra and tricuspid valves, and you can see coronaries. This is right coronary going into right um, AV groove, and this is any that's complex going from the, from the other side. So what? TG. <laughs> so what? So now we have very peculiar connections. When you get um, systemic venous return going back to the systemic circulation, while pulmonary venous return still oxygenated going into the lungs. Again, already loaded with oxygen. Obviously, this is um, um, a circulation that is not compatible with life. Because, so, if the blood goes into the systemic circulation and uh, comes back with a saturation of 60, then goes back to the systemic, comes back with a saturation of 20, and the third cycle will come with no oxygen and then it's done. So you cannot have a circulation like that because this is incompatible with life. So to, to be able to sustain life in these patients, because these patients do survive till they present, okay? So how do, do they survive after birth till, till presentation? By... Uh, some site of mixing, where some oxygenated blood mixes into the deoxygenated blood. So some oxygen, oxygen goes into the systemic, while some deoxygenated blood will go to the lungs to get, to get oxygen back. So there has to be some sites of mixing, where oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mix together, and then this allows survival. So we have three levels of mixing. So one level is to mix a, across the atria a PFO or an ASD. The other level is mixing across ventricles if the patient gets a VSD. The third uh, level is communication between great arteries, so aorta and pulmonary, like PDA or, or other, other things. <coughs> so two of these are actually uh, normally present in, in any newborn, which is a PFO, 
and PDA, and they both have tendency to close early after birth. And so um, they, are, they are essential for the survival of these patients, and that's why we need to maintain these sites and do not allow their closure because otherwise the baby will not survive. Okay? We'll discuss management very thoroughly in, in, the, in the other talk, but uh, uh, for now we're just discussing physiology. So do you think these patients uh, are fully saturated or are they cyanosed? Cyanosed, why? Because of the deoxygenated blood going toward. Why? Because of the parent situations. Because deoxygenated blood goes to the right ventricle, which is connected to the aorta, while oxygenated blood going back to the pulmonary. So you get two parent situations. So let's assume a patient has a VSD. Um, will the pulmonary flow be high or low? High. high. Is that patient cyanotic or is he feel fully saturated? Cyanotic. Still cyanotic with high pulmonary flow. So again, cyanosis does not mean low pulmonary flow. Patient can be really, really cyanotic while having very high pulmonary flow. So again, I'm, I'm just making sure that not every cyanotic patient um, is treated by increasing his pulmonary flow because he can already have very high pulmonary flow. But the problem is there's no mixing because of the parent patients. So again, this is in distinction of a disease like tetralogy of fallow, where actually patients with tetralogy of fallow are cyanotic. But this is because the absolute amount of pulmonary blood flow is actually low because a lot of blood, the deoxygenated blood, will go into the aorta because there's severe pulmonary stenosis and there's a VSD that allows shunting of that deoxygenated blood into the aorta. So you get deoxygenated blood that goes into the aorta. And these patients actually, actually have low pulmonary flow. So they, be they benefit from increasing low pulmonary flow. And TGA is very different. The problem here is not that the pulmonary flow is low. The pulmonary flow is most of the time is actually quite high, but the problem is the parallel circulation. The third course, cause for, cyano, for the central cyanosis here is um, uh, total mixing. Uh, patients like uh, trachospiratrisi or so, where uh, again, deoxygenated blood will eventually go to the, to the aorta, but that's a, a different disease. So these patients, by, necess by necessity, they have cyanosis because of the parallel circulation. <coughs> so um, normally, a, no a normal subject, uh, systemic and pulmonary circulation run in series, series, which means blood coming from the, the systemic circulation will go into the pulmonary circulation, then go back into the systemic, then go to the pulmonary, then go to systemic, then go to the pulmonary. So it's a, a, as if there's a very long queue and the blood is going, following each other, okay? While in the TGA, they're actually almost two separate circulations where they actually then uh, rotate independently with, with some levels of mixing to maintain uh, some oxygenation into the system. And so we've discussed the importance of mixing. And then there's a, there's a big implication here. So let's assume that um, this is pulmonary venous return going back to the heart, and then being pumped again to the lungs, while the systemic venous return to the heart, again, pumped back into the systemic circulation. And then there's some amount of blood will be able to mix to deliver oxygen into the systemic and deoxygenated blood into the, the lungs. So actually, we call that about this amount of mixed blood that is able to cross to the other side, the effective flow. So effective pulmonary flow is the amount of deoxygenated blood that was able to cross into the pulmonary circulation, while the effective systemic flow is the oxygenated blood coming from the lungs that was able to cross over and then go into the systemic circulation which is very different from the total blood flow. 
So you can see that this is the total pulmonary flow, while that is the effective pulmonary flow. Okay, and again, here, this is total systemic flow, that is effective systemic flow, okay? This actually has big implications while calculating the magnitude of shunts during cath. Because when you do the fixed method, you actually calculate the effective flow, the, the, to, the total flow, the effective flow rather than the total flow. And so this does not give an idea about that whole amount of blood. So, um, um, two legions that actually maintain survival is VSD or PDA. Uh, these two legions actually cause in increase in pulmonary blood flow, and if they are large enough, they can cause increase in pulmonary pressure. So, patients with PGA are actually commonly associated with pulmonary hypertension because the, the lesions that maintain survival actually in, co cause increase in pulmonary blood flow. And then, well, why did you say that in normal subjects, in normal, the LV is thicker wall than the RV? Because it is exposed to the systemic circulation. Systemic pressure is higher than pulmonary pressure because the systemic vascular resistance is higher than pulmonary vascular resistance. So what do you think in the TGA will happen? What will be the pressure in the LV? Would it be higher or, norm or lower than normal subjects? Lower. lower. Why? It is exposed to the pulmonary circulation, which has low pulmonary vascular resistance, and so the low pulmonary pressure. And so the LV is exposed to much lower pressure, while the RV is exposed to higher pressure, which is the systemic circulation. So in patients with TGA, the RV wall is actually quite thicker than normal, while LV wall starts getting thinner. And then with time, the LV wall thickness will be too low to be able to sustain high pressure. Okay, so we call that LV deconditioning. So as if, if you stop going to the gym, you lose your muscle, and then you're not able to lift high weights. So this is exactly the same. So after birth, the LV wall is still thick enough because during the fetal life, the pulmonary pressure is high. And then immediately after birth, there's a sharp decline of the pulmonary vascular resistance, so the PA pressure drops, but still is higher than the adult level. And it stayed that, like that for a few weeks. So during these first few weeks, the LV wall thickness starts to become much thinner. And so the LV starts deconditioning very quickly within the first few weeks. And then it's, it stops being able to sustain high pressure. And then if you correct the TGA later, like after two, three months, then you might very well get LV failure because this LV was exposed to a pressure of 20 for like a, a month, and then you want it to be exposed directly to the pressure of 80. It will just not be able to sustain that, okay? So this is very important to um, describe the state of LV conditioning either either the LV as a condition or decondition. So we say if the LV wall thickness is good enough to sustain high pressure, we call that that the LV is conditioned. While if the LV is a very thin wall, we call that LV is deconditioned. Please notice that if a patient has a big VSD, systemic pressure will be directly transmitted into the LV. And then the LV will still be subjected to high pressure. And then, the LV does not decondition. On the other hand, if there is LV tube obstruction, which is pulmonary stenosis, the LV will have to exert high pressure against that stenosis, and then the LV will be exposed to higher pressure, and then again, 
will still be conditioned. So these are the, the common associations, the VSD and the LV chip structure, and they both aid into keeping the LV condition. So, so, so these are the, uh, the important parameters uh, when we go through different um, associations to discuss management. So um, how much cyanosis? Is the patient very cyanotic or less, depending on pressures, uh, pre presence of mixing? Uh, does he have a VSD or a PDE or not? And the state of the LV, is it conditioned or deconditioned? <laughs> so patients with TGA have to sustain life by some sort of mixing. And then, um, to be able to sustain mixing, uh, we have to maintain either an open ASD or an open PD. Again, we'll discuss that thoroughly in the, in the uh, talk about management. But then we're just to, um, uh, touching a really important uh, uh, topic, which you can just ignore if you do not get it. Yeah, yeah, this is important to know, not necessarily important to know why. <laughs> so. Uh, you can maintain PDE open with medications, with prostin, prostaglandin, uh, but this is again not reliable because once you stop the prostin, the PDE will just close. A more reliable way is to open an ASD, and this can be done percutaneously with a balloon. So you go with a balloon into, into the right atrium, through the patent form of well, into the right left atrium, you inflate the balloon, you pull that back. You actually tear the interior septum, and this is quite thin in neonates, so this can be done. And actually, it does maintain good mixing and actually reliable because you do not need to continue on infusions or anything. The patient is, is uh, maintained with a good cycle mixing. Till he does obviously something else, till he, he stabilizes and then gets something else. So, this is called uh, balloon atrial septostomy, um, uh, or called Rushkin uh, after the. Uh, the intervention is who, uh, who describe it. So this balloon atrial septostomy does save lives, okay? But then we've noticed something, that if patients get balloon atrial septostomy, the LV starts deconditioning a lot quicker than patients who did not have the balloon atrial septostomy, which is actually quite weird. So this is a normal subject, normal heart, where SVC, IVC, deoxygenated blood, right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary. Then the blood goes to the lungs, oxygenated left atrium, left ventricle, aorta. Then systemic, then pulmonary. So this is the heart, the blood goes from the systemic into the lung, from the lungs into the systemic, from the systemic into the lung, from the lung into the systemic. So this is circulations in series. series. If, if this subject does not have any shunts, what would be the ratio between the pulmonary flow and systemic flow? One to one. one, to one. So why? Yeah. Because it's circulation series. So whatever resistance here or there, the blood has to wait till because it has no other pathway. Okay, so all the systemic has to go into that queue. Then, if so, if someone stays here and counts amount of blood per unit time, and another one stands here, they will actually count the same number, regardless of the resistance, because secretions are in series and the blood has no other pathway. So we've discussed that. Uh, uh, very heavily during the, the talk in the pathophysiology of left structures. So by necessity, patients with um, um, uh, circulations in series with no chance, they have QPQS of one. So the amount of blood flow per unit time going to the systemic circulation is equal to that going into the pulmonary circulation. 
So, in the patients with normally connected heart, if a patient has an ASD, okay, this is a normally connected heart, and then you create a communication here between left atrium and right atrium. Would the blood flow go from the left atrium to the right atrium or the reverse? So left normally, right. does it go left to right, left to right. or right to left? Left, left to right? Left to right. Why is that? The, the pressure gradient is higher in the left ventricle compared to the right one. Great. Uh, is that higher during systole or diastole? Why, why, again, why is the pressure higher in the left ventricle? Due to the, the systemic circulation back, uh, pressure back. OK, so the blood, this LV pumps against the systemic circulation. Exactly. And so the pressure in the systemic circulation is higher. Yeah. Why? Uh, vascular resistance. So systemic vascular resistance is higher than pulmonary vascular resistance. Yeah. So if you have to push the same amount of blood, LV will have to push higher pressure, higher pressure to push the same amount of blood against higher resistance. So the LV pressure is higher than RV pressure. Do you agree? You just said that. So does that happen in systole or diastole? Systole. 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 Because during systole, the aortic valve is open. And so the LV pressure is high, while the RV pressure is lower. And during systole, what's the state of the mitral intercostal valve? Closed. They're closed. So does the atria know anything about this high pressure? No. No. If there's no regurg, it wouldn't. OK? OK. When, when, do, you, when do they communicate? Diastole. diastole. What's the state of the aortic and pulmonary valve during diastole? Close. Close. So does the atria know anything about the aortic pressure? No. No. So Why is LA pressure higher than R pressure? It is because the LV pumps against the higher pressure circulation. But actually indirectly. <coughs> so LV pumps against aorta with higher pressure. So it has to get thicker wall to be able to pump against higher pressure. And then, would it be easier for you to inflate a thick wall balloon or a thin wall balloon? Thin wall balloon. It is much easier, again, because of the compliance. So because of the higher pressure in the systemic circulation, the LV wall thickness is more. So the LV compliance is less, and so LV and the stolic pressure is higher, just slightly higher, a few centimeters water um, uh, uh, higher. So L pressure is just slightly higher than R pressure because LV and the stolic pressure is slightly higher than the RV and the stolic pressure because LV wall thickness is slightly thicker than RV wall thickness. Okay? So in normally connected hearts, L pressure is slightly higher than R pressure, and so. ASD would chunt left to right. Okay. So what happens at TG? So which ventricle has worse compliance? RV. RV. RV wall thickness is more than LV wall thickness. So RA pressure should be higher than LA pressure. And so, if a patient gets an ASD, you would expect him to shunt right atrium to left atrium. Correct? You just said so. <laughs> okay. This assumes that circulations are in series. And the TGA is very, very different. Circulations are actually in parallel. Parallel in, in serious circulation, that amount of blood has to go into the other circulation, and that amount of blood has to go to the other circulation. On the other hand, in circulations, when the circulations are in parallel, they do not have to be similar to each other at all, because they're as if they are two different patients that have the same heart rate, because the right and left ventricle essentially contracts with the same rate. Okay? But then they're very different. And so it's actually not exactly like that. It is actually like that. 
So the systemic circuit for blood to go into the tooth and come back, it's actually longer distance than going from the heart into the lungs and coming back. So actually the, 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 the distance is a lot less to the lungs. And actually the pulmonary vascular resistance is a lot, lot less than the systemic. And so for the blood to go into the systemic circulation, if, if I am a, tear, a, a drop of blood, to be able to go into the systemic circulation and come back, okay, let's assume just a number, that I will go that in like five, six heartbeats. Another blood drop in the, the pulmonary circulation will go and come back in almost the same beat, or like two, okay? So the, the, the pulmonary circulation is a lot faster than the systemic one, they're, they're separate. We just have some, sh some mixing across, but they're separate. What is blood flow? It's amount of blood per unit time. So regardless of total amount of blood flow in this circulation and the other, if someone is sitting here counting the amount of blood, how many milliliters of blood per unit time, and another one sitting there counting how many milliliters per unit time, and then, this one will start counting a lot higher than that. So normally in patients with PGE, regardless of presence of VSD or PDE, pulmonary blood flow is a lot higher than systemic blood flow because of that very fast circulation, because the circulation is a lot shorter, but also the resistance is a lot lower. So the blood doesn't have any resistance, does have very low resistance. And then it goes really, really, really quick while the systemic circulation will take much longer time. So if I'm counting the amount of blood per unit time, I count a lot more blood into the pulmonary circulation rather than the systemic. And so the amount of blood coming into the left atrium is actually quite high, as if the left atrium is very crowded because the blood keeps going and go going back. While although the compliance of the RV is worse, the amount of blood coming back into the right atrium is a lot lower. And so if you open an ASD, actually the blood in the crowded chamber will actually go into the other chamber, although it has worse compliance. So if a big road is very, very, very crowded, and a smaller road that's totally empty, actually cars will go into the, the narrower road, which is empty. Do you get the, the similarity? So although the right ventricular compliance is worse than LV compliance in patients with TGA, actually the amount coming back into the left atrium is a lot high because of this very fast circulation. And then shunting across ASD will still be predominantly left to right till a balance occurs. Because if, let's assume that there are two parallel circulations and then you get one connection and that connection is unidirection. Blood always goes in one direction. So this, this circulation will, will get empty. So you cannot get that because, again, the pressure will become lower and then blood will go back. So I just mean <coughs> patients with TGA, while having very small ASD, will have a whole volume load into the left side of the heart, including the left ventricle. So although after birth, the pressure load gets lower on left ventricle because of dropping pulmonary vascular resistance, the LV is still volume loaded till a rush kind is done. And then that volume load actually gets offloaded because the blood will go to the other side. And then the LV will not be neither pressure loaded nor volume loaded. And then the LV gets really deconditioned. Okay? This is a difficult concept to grasp, but just be noted that we know for a fact patients with big ASD will decondition a lot faster than patients with TGA who have much smaller ASD. Okay? <clears throat> Are you still living? Are you still there? <laughs> so we've, we've passed the difficult part. <coughs> so what, what if a patient has a TGA and we don't do anything. That's natural history, okay? So 90% of patients with TG intact septum will die during the first year of life. Th that's a lethal disease, yeah? For every 10 patients, 
nine will die during the first year. Okay? So, um, again, because of very low oxygenation, because of poor mixing, because TGA with intact septum have a lot less uh, uh, sites for mixing. Um, they're very sick. They, they get profound cyanosis and secretory collapse. On the other hand, patients with VSD, who actually does have um, um, an association with a VSD, obviously, the bigger the VSD, the, the more effect. They are less cyanotic because this is a site of mixing, but also because the pulmonary blood flow will be very, very high, so some of that blood will be able to, to cross to the other side. The, they're less cyanotic, but they very quickly develop congestive heart failure and pulmonary vascular disease. Um, actually, patients with TGE and VSD develop pulmonary vascular disease. I mean, they develop Eisenmenger syndrome a lot earlier than patients with the same size VSD and who have normally connected heart. So, patient with VSD only. Another patient who has same size, same type of VSD, but also has TGE. <coughs> The patients with TGA will develop pulmonary vascular occlusive disease, I mean, Eisenmenger syndrome, a whole lot quicker than patients with VSD only. We, we know that for a fact. Why is that? Might be because of the very, very high pulmonary flow because of the, the parallel circulation. Might be because of um, effect of oxygen free radicals, very high oxygen content into the Whatever, we just know that patients with TGA actually can develop pulmonary vascular disease as early as 6 to 12 months. This is very early. <coughs> so, this is for today. So, we've discussed TGA. TGA is a really important disease. It's a difficult one, and not a rare one. Um, we mean by, by TGA that DTGA is AV concordance, BA discordance. So it is um, um, the second most common cyanotic heart disease. It is more prevalent in males than females. So we've, we've discussed um, um, anatomy and embryology. Uh, we just said that it is very commonly associated with uh, VSD, LV2 obstruction, any one of those mm -hmm. or both. And uh, we've discussed pathophysiology. Uh, the important thing here to, to remember is the parallel circulation, the cyanosis, the fast pulmonary flu, um, higher likelihood of developing pulmonary hypertension, um, the tendency to get LV deconditioning, and um, the implication of that on any, on any um, um, uh, type of management. And we've said it is um, a really serious disease. Um, most, the vast majority of patients with TGA intact septum will die within the first year. Uh, patients with TGA, VSD um, are less sick, but they have a higher tendency to develop uh, congestive heart failure and pulmonary vascular disease. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? It's an radiation. Uh, whatever you want. The low risk of deconditioning will be BAS. Okay. So the question is, if a patient has a naturally occurring ASD, would the LV also decondition quickly, or does it only occur after the balloon atrial septostomy? No. Again, it is the same physiology. So if a patient was already born with a, a naturally occurring big ASD, you expect that patient to get deconditioned LV a lot quicker than others. Why do we say the deconditioning and the timing? Because this is the only phase where you're able to correct them and do the RTL switch. Otherwise, you'll have to do other maneuvers, either totally different operation or um, a, a preparation to be able to do that again. So this is the, the period where you're able to do this operation. In most patients, this is during the first month of life. So um, if patients have uh, much bigger ASD or they had balloon septostomy, this actually window might be short. Okay, or patient might get sicker after the operation because of the, the poor LV function. There's some sort related to this question. Uh, asking about the dilemma of uh, maintaining a naturally occurring site for the mixing through the BDA 
uh, with using of the prostaglandins, is it uh, better than maintaining the physiological mixing through the interatrial communication, each of which with the uh, consequences of the prolonged use of the prostaglandins or uh, making an atrial septal uh, defect or uh, ensuring a good mixing through the interatrial communication with the subsequent deconditioning of the LV, each of which to use or each of which the, will be the better decision. So the question is, uh, is it better to have uh, an open PDA, so just give prostin, or is it better uh, uh, just noting that uh, if you do balloon atrial septostomy, you get earlier deconditioning, um, is it better to do uh, balloon atrial septostomy? Uh, it depends. Uh, we, we will discuss these options um, um, quite thoroughly during the, the, the management talk, but just to give you a, a quick hint. So uh, uh, prostaglandin alone, the prostin, is actually uh, known to, to cause apnea. So patients on prostin can very well need mechanical ventilation because of apnea, while they, they were not needing that uh, before. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, long duration of prostaglandin might get unreliable because of simple causes like cannula coming out or, or the drug uh, discontinuing or anything. So if, if you need to actually transfer a patient into a center, uh, a tertiary center that actually does arterial switch, it's not very safe to transfer him on, on prostin and then when your cannula comes out during the, the, the way, uh, the patient can actually collapse. Uh, on the other hand, balloon atria septostomy uh, does have problems. So there are uh, problems obviously with LVD conditioning but also with vascular access in very small new, um, newborns. And so again, it depends. It depends uh, where is the patient as regards to the next um, um, uh, planned intervention. So if a patient presents into a center that is actually doing arterial switch, we would normally not use, not do uh, balloon atrial You just put him on prostin till he is stable, till he goes directly to the, to the RTS switch. On the other hand, if a patient is like 700 kilometers from um, uh, a center that will do, do that and he needs to be transferred either by plane or a very long um, uh, ambulance road or so, uh, it's actually quite uh, unreliable to do that on prostate. So it, it is a judgment call. So they are both tools. Uh, we need just to know the advantage and disadvantage of, of each and then we do. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Do you have any other questions? Yeah? So uh, why do patients who have uh, TGA with BSD uh, have different uh, causes? I mean, we, we, we have seen patients who have uh, large BSDs, but uh, yeah, we have to really operate on them fast because they, the, the ventricles will be deconditioned and the saturation is actually not high enough. And we have seen, on the other hand, some patients with TGA and BSDs that present late beyond the neonatal period and we can do what this which uh, smoothly the patient eventually get good out. So can you reflect on us? And, and, and in the context of streaming versus mixing. Thanks. So the question is, uh, okay, I said uh, TGE with VSD have better saturations. They have big uh, site of mixing. Uh, we've seen patients with TG and big VSD, and they were very, very, very cyanotic. And they actually improve quite a lot with balloon atrial septostomy. And so you make a much smaller communication across the atria, and the saturation really improves, while ha having a very big communication across the ventricle, and still the patient was very, very cyanotic. Um, th this has a lot to do with the concept of streaming. So do you remember talking about the toxic being anomaly? Although these patients have really big VSD, most of the oxygenated blood in the LV, by the effect of streaming, goes directly into the pulmonary artery. What is the streaming? So streaming is um, the, the fact that two streams of blood, which have different characteristics, they have no physical barrier in between, yet they meet and leave each other, with still different characteristics. So they do not totally mix. So the streaming is the opposite of total mixing. Okay? And this is very obvious in the double outlet ventricle. 
where although there's a really, really big uh, VSD, it's a lot easier for oxygenated blood to the go directly into the lungs, while deoxygenated blood going to the wood. It's actually quite difficult for blood to go this way, again, because of streaming. And because most of the mixing, uh, what I mean, most of blood flowing across VSD, occurs actually during systole. So during systole, the blood flow is actually quite fast. And so the time is not enough for enough mixing. OK? <coughs> well, this is um, quite different in ASD. Because um, during the ASD, blood will just go from the veins into the ventricle. Well, during systole, the mitral and tricuspid are closed. And when there's a big ASD, there's a lot of time for blood to start mixing all around. This does not happen in the ventricles. The blood flow across the ventricle is quite fast. Most of the shunting across the VSD is during systole. The blood doesn't have enough uh, time to mix. And there's a lot of streaming um, in the ventricles. So yes, although VS, patients with VSD have higher pulmonary flow and they tend to get better saturation, this is not necessarily. Um, streaming plays a big role here. And it depends on the size of the VSD, but also the site of the VSD. So if the VSD is towards the inlet, um, blood going during the S3 will have better chance to mix than blood uh, VSD during the outlet, where blood is mostly going there during systole, where there's a lot of effect of streaming. So yes, uh, patients with TGA VSD can still, although the, the VSD is very big, patients can present in very deep cyanosis requiring balloon atrial septosis, paradoxically. Okay? Have that answered your question? And uh, this will reflect on the conditioning process as well? No, no, because this, this is different. Um, so streaming is different than direct uh, transmission of pressure. So if there is big communication, by necessity, this chamber is subjected to higher pressure. The, the type of blood in, in, inside it is different, but the pressure is high because it is direct effect of, of pressure transmission. So um, uh, patients with big VSD, unrestrictive VSD, will have direct transmission of pressure from the systemic ventricle to the pulmonary ventricle, and so both ventricles will have very near pressure. So the LV, LV will still be conditioned, although the, there's still the effect of streaming, so most of the... So if you take sample from the aorta and the pulmonary arteries, they will be quite different, although there's a big VSD because of the streaming. Because, because, uh, because now there are two communicating compartments, so the pressure equalization is, is almost achieved. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, are these deconditioned? Is it uh, just objective echo finding? Uh, let's say maybe it remains old. I say it's deconditioned, if you say it's deconditioned. So th that's, a, that's a big topic, and I think Soha will, will touch a lot on, on that. Uh, so th the question is. How would you actually judge the conditioning? It's, is it an echo finding? Is it a, a clinical finding? Um, uh, wall thickness, mass, MRI, whatever. So there are lots of parameters here. Um, and that's a, a relatively big topic. So we'll just discuss that uh, with, with diagnosis and management. So I, I hope after the, the other talks, th this uh, question will be asked. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you.